This week on C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast, a class on women journalists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Iowa State University professor Tracy Luke describes the careers of some pioneers such as Nellie Bly and Dorothy Dix and the societal pressures they faced while trying to balance work and family. Good morning. Um, Thank you for being here today. Today's lecture is about American women journalists of the late 19th century. This is one of my absolute favorite things to talk about, as I'm sure you all can imagine. So I'm just going to dive right into it. The title of today's talk is Stunt Reporters and Sob Sisters. And that's because these labels represent a new kind of job that emerged for women at the end of the 19th century. And I want to tell you the story of how some pretty um, bold and remarkable women um, seized the opportunities created by the circumstances of their time to carve out a public space for themselves and to make a voice for themselves and for others when women's voices were not um, welcomed or, or respected that much. So uh, history is always the story of individuals responding creatively to the conditions and circumstances in which they live. Um, And so to really understand how um, this unfolded and how this new type of job, that being a newspaper reporter um, in some of the biggest cities of the country, to understand how this came about we really have to back up and talk about the business of journalism in the 1800s. And specifically, I want to talk about a new business model that emerged in the 1830s called the Penny Press. Okay? This was a new type of newspaper um, that began in New York City. Right? Any ideas why it would have been called the Penny Press? It was cheaper, absolutely. Yep, it was sold for a penny. Um, you know, this was a new idea in journalism. Until then, newspapers had been sold mainly by subscription. They catered to the business class and political elites, and they were far more expensive. They cost um, about $10 a year for a subscription, which was a lot of money back then, um, and up to six pennies for one issue. Um, The idea for a cheap newspaper actually didn't come from a journalist at all. It came from a medical student named Horatio Shepard, who noticed as he walked to medical school um, in New York City how many vendors were on the streets selling things for just a penny. And what he noticed was that people were willing to buy anything for a penny. You know, they they were willing to give up a penny pretty easily. So his idea was, why not sell a newspaper for a penny? Right? and fill it with content um, that would be um, of interest that particular day, that would be entertaining, that would um, you know, give people um, a reason to buy it. So he tried, this medical student, uh, with the help of our friend Horace Greeley. You remember him of the New York Tribune. Uh, and it failed. It didn't work out for him. However, other people took up the challenge and made a go of it. So... These newspapers, these penny papers, had some characteristics that made them different. Um, For one thing, they catered to the masses, right? Because the idea was to sell at a high volume, to sell a high volume of newspaper at a low price, as opposed to selling just a few newspapers at a really high price, right? So in order to appeal to as many readers as possible, they wrote in a more conversational way. They wrote stories um, about the city in which people were living. They wrote stories about crime. They, um, they wrote everyday kind of news, right? They were catering to the mass over the class, so to speak, right? Um, so what else? They were competitive. As more and more of these newspapers cropped up, they began competing with each other for the most up-to-the-minute information. They they wrote um, tall tales sometimes, scandalous um, types of things. 
And the biggest difference was that now, because their purpose was to attract lots of eyeballs, they could charge more for advertising, right? So this is a shift in the business model of journalism. And it's one that's probably still recognizable to you today, right? The idea is to sell the content pretty cheaply to attract a high circulation or lots of readers and then to charge advertisers for the opportunity to reach those readers. Uh, the first of these newspapers was started by Benjamin Day in 1833. It was the New York Sun. Um, you can see there it even says price one cent. Um, and the motto of the New York Sun was it shines for all. Why that motto? Well, because it was aimed, again, at regular people, not just opinion leaders, right? Um, this was possible for a lot of different reasons um, from the period, right? For one thing, urban populations were growing. Um, the economy was growing. You had a middle class that was growing, so more people were able to buy newspapers, but also um, advertisers were more interested in reaching those people. Literacy rates were growing. Democratic reforms, expanding uh, voting privileges, were giving um, you know, average Americans uh, a feeling of more enfranchisement, um, a greater interest in, in the affairs of their communities. Um, and steam power, of course, was making it possible to print many more copies of these newspapers than could have been printed by f before. But again, if you print a lot of newspapers, you have to sell a lot of newspapers. So what do you think happened? How do you sell, how do you sell newspapers? How do you get attention? How do you attract attention? What do you think, what do you think they did? Any thoughts? Say that again? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you get out on the street and you sell newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you sensationalize a bit, right? Um, and that is, in fact, what the New York Sun was, was known for. It, um, one of its, um, its, its most successful uh, sort of series of stories was called The Great Moon Hoax. And this was a series of stories in 1835 in which the New York Sun reported that life had been discovered on the moon. They reported on um, a, an article that had been written in a Scottish journal, um, allegedly reporting this discovery. Um, there uh, allegedly was plant life and fauna on the moon, and um, even some, some winged bat-like creatures that um, resembled the flying monkeys in The Wizard of Oz, much, much later. But um, in 1835, that's what they said lived on the moon. Well, of course this was a tall tale. Of course, it was a humbug. Of course, it was made up. And all the other newspapers called out the New York Sun for making this up. The New York Sun, however, never admitted it. And not only that, but its circulation rose um, to rival that of the Times of London, which was by then the most read newspaper in the whole world. So this put the New York Sun on the map. It was fun. It was entertaining. Um, they reported on... Um, um, courts and, and, and police reports and crime. This hadn't been done before. Another type of, or another uh, newspaper that was founded about this time was the New York Herald, founded by James Gordon Bennett in 1835. His was a little bit different. His mission was to provide a correct picture of the world, to give people information about their city um, and to be independent of politics, of religion, of the elite at that time. He shocked readers with this, by the way. He, um, he came out and said, you know, we don't um, practice any particular religion. You know, we're not Protestants, we're not Catholics. Um, he called things what they were. He used really frank language. Um, if you can believe it, he used the word legs in his newspaper instead of limbs right? Um, scandalous, right? He used, um, he used words like pantaloons. He, he actually called things what they were. Um, and he dared the, the, you know, the, the, the folks in power, the, the upper classes, to, um, to challenge him. He was extremely innovative. 
Uh, um, a lot of what we recognize in journalism today uh, was a result of Bennett's innovation. He um, came up with the idea of personal ads to create more revenue for his newspaper. He established the beat system of reporting, right? You still go into newsrooms and people will um, tell you what particular beat they're covering, um, meaning that somebody is assigned to cover courts, somebody's assigned to cover crime, somebody's assigned to cover politics. Um, that was Bennett's innovation, right? He established the first Washington press corps in Washington, D.C. Uh, previous to that, um, lawmakers, when they had hearings and debates, um, in good time, they would provide those to the Washington papers to publish. Bennett was the first one who said, you know, we should be covering this in real time, as, you know, as soon as it's happening. Um, and so he created a, a press corps to do that. He changed the definition of news. So why is this important? Why am I starting with the penny press? It's because I want you to keep this in mind, right? As Mark Twain said, um, whatever it is that newspapers say their objective is, um, it's actually to make money. That's their real motivation. And so keep that in mind as we switch gears a little bit, okay? Because the other thing that you need to know about this time period to understand this rise of a new type of um, female journalist was you need to know about gender norms in the 19th century, okay? Um, what did people think about gender and what it meant to be a man versus a woman? There are two primary ideas here um, that, that are important. One is the notion of separate spheres for men and women. The ideology of this period was that um, men's work uh, was, was public, it was important, it was for men, and that women um, had other attributes, other qualities, um, they were natural caretakers, and that the two spheres should be kept separate, right? Men were assumed to be naturally more intelligent, um, you know, active, um, in charge, right, aggressive. Women were assumed um, to be better at raising the children and running the household. You know, obviously, at this time, women, they couldn't vote. Their education opportunities were far more limited than men's. They lacked property rights in many states. Indeed, they were treated like property themselves. Um, part of this ideology came from religion, right? It was believed that, it, that, that God intended men to be the leaders and that God intended women to take care of their families um, physically, spiritually, intellectually. It was believed that women were, so to speak, the better sex, that they were uh, purer of mind and heart, right? Um, and that they were needed to sort of keep their menfolk um, in line and to keep um, their families on a straight spiritual path. But another reason that, that the separation of spheres was so entrenched at this time was that the Industrial Revolution had changed. It was changing the patterns of people's homes and people's work. And it was taking work which to that point had been in the home, it was taking it out of the home, right? So that people were beginning to leave their homes to go to work um, for wages, as opposed to producing all of their home goods and working the land and doing their work, you know, sort of as a family unit. So you start to see this distinction between public, the public realm, which was that of work and politics, and men, and the private realm, which was uh, the province of women, right? The home, um, the, you know, the domestic life of a particular family. So, separation of spheres. Men and women are to be kept apart. Um, number two, Barbara Welter, um, a historian famously, uh, wrote about the cult of true womanhood in the 1800s. And what she meant by this was that to be a lady... A proper lady at this time required four things of women. Uh, piety. They had to be pious, meaning they had to be religious, right? Purity. They had to be pure of 
mind and body, right? Submissiveness. They had to be submissive uh, to the men in their lives. Um, and finally, uh, domestic. Um, they had to be well-trained and able to manage um, the affairs of the household. So women were put on a pedestal, so to speak, um, in terms of being the better sex, being a, the protected, a protected class. Um, however, they were also chained to that pedestal because it restricted their areas of influence, right? It restricted their opportunities and what they were able to do. And, of course, it always um, depended on their livelihoods, depended on the ability of the men around them to properly, to care for them, to provide for them materially and physically. And we know that that didn't always happen, which is something that will come up a bit later. Okay, so what's a girl to do in this situation, right? What if um, you needed to work? What if you needed money? What if you had lost um, your male provider, right? How would you negotiate this situation? What if you wanted to work, to write, to be a professional? What if you had things to say? What kinds of strategies could you use? Well, there are two women who I think really illustrate um, the response to these types of conditions. And if you look at them, they look very similar, right? Don't they look alike? They look like they could be the same woman, right? But they, in fact, were very different people and they did not like each other. One of them um, was Sarah Josepha Hale, the other, Margaret Fuller. And I want to talk about... Um, their experiences as influential, extremely significant um, women journalists of their day because, again, it sets the stage for what's to come. So Sarah Josepha Hale, the first female editor of a women's magazine. She was the editor of a magazine called Godey's Ladies Book, which was one of the most important magazines of its time, um, achieved circulations um, that had, had not been seen before. Um, extremely important person um, in journalism of the 1800s. She was a widow. She was widowed by her husband um, and had five children to feed. She needed to work, right? She started to write. Um, she had had... Um, Limited education, mainly what she was able to get um, in her home. Um, but she wrote poetry, and she wrote a really successful novel that enabled her to, um, to find some other opportunities. By the way, she eventually uh, wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. So there you have it. Um, Sarah Josepha Hale wrote, wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, but she was best known as an influential editor. Um, she was the embodiment of a lady for her time. She had impeccable taste in fashion and home decor and literature. She was as traditionally feminine as one could get. She was deeply religious, right? And she used her editorship of this magazine to tell other women how they could best live up to God's plan for them how they could best care for their families and their children, right? Um, she was a strong advocate uh, for equal education for women. She helped found Vassar College, which was a, um, a women's college. Um, she believed that women should be uh, physicians, right? However, she didn't believe that women should vote. She believed in education for women because it would help them to take care of their families, because it would help, it would help women carry out their um, God-given duties, right? So she, um, she, she was extremely influential for her time, um, but also managed to remain a lady. She lobbied um, several presidents um, to make Thanksgiving a national holiday, she finally um, got Lincoln to do it. So um, 
it was partly, I guess, um, her doing that, that we, we celebrate Thanksgiving as a national holiday. Okay, so that's Sarah Joseph Hale. Margaret Fuller is a different story. Margaret Fuller, um, remarkable, brilliant woman, educated by her father, um, who encouraged her, gave her a classical education in Greek and Latin and French, Italian, philosophy and history. They lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? home to Harvard, where many of her male friends um, attended. She, however, was not able to attend. Um, she had to rely on lessons that her male friends were able to, um, to bring home to her. But yet, she was highly intelligent. She was recognized as being highly intelligent. Um, and the family had um, you know, a, a, a strong intellectual circle around them. Except then her dad went broke and moved the family to a farm. He, she ended up having to take care of, um, of everybody, you know. Um, again, loss of a male provider required her to become a teacher. That was one of the accepted jobs for women, always was teaching, because it was, right, it was part of caretaking and, and, and bringing up children. Um, Eventually, she got bored. She moved back to the Boston area. She, um, she hung out with the transcendentalists. Her friends included Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, Thoreau. Together, this group founded a literary magazine called The Dial, and they made her editor. I have a hunch they just sort of wanted her to do all the work of editor, um, but she did it. And, and she was proud of it, and, um, and it, was a, it was a very um, well-received, critically acclaimed magazine. Um, so she's in this circle of friends. She's, you know, moving and shaking with some of the, you know, deepest thinkers of her time. Everybody knows that she's brilliant, she's capable, she's got stuff to say. Oh, except nobody wanted to marry her. Because she wasn't perceived as being ladylike. Right? She wasn't doing what Sarah Hale was doing. She was not, you know, fulfilling some kind of traditional image of what it meant to be um, a lady. And this frustrated her deeply. Um, she, um, she wrote a book in 1845 called Woman in the 19th Century, um, a feminist book. Um, she got the attention of Horace Greeley. Again, you notice he keeps coming up, right? Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, who was impressed with her, who hired her to be a literary critic. Um, she's not in the newsroom. She's, write, you know, she's writing from home. She's a correspondent. But Greeley gives her some opportunities that hadn't been available um, to women before. And she becomes the first female foreign correspondent. He sends her to Europe, and she uh, responds with um, letters and correspondence about goings-on in, um, in all sorts of countries. Um, Sarah Hale thought that Margaret Fuller was not a good role model. And this is what Sarah Hale had to say about Margaret Fuller. She thought that she was ignoring the one true book, Okay, what, what, what is the one true book, do you think? Yes, thank you, the Bible, yes. Um, and that, that Fuller, according to Hale, was proof that the greater the intellectual force, the greater and more fatal the errors into which women fall who wander from the rock of salvation, Christ the Savior. So Fuller was influential, right? But she also... Um, you know, was, to be honest, sort of, she was treated as sort of a freak. She didn't get to be, you know, both a public intellectual and a brilliant writer and a traditional woman. It just wasn't, it wasn't in the cards for her. And in fact, her story, she, she's in Europe, um, you know, uh, writing for Horace Greeley. Um, she meets um, a guy 10 years younger, Giovanni Angelo, which sounds, I don't know about you guys, but Giovanni Angelo sounds pretty exciting to me. Um, they, had, they became lovers. They had a baby out of wedlock. Um, they got married later 
um, got involved in the Roman Revolution, sailed off for America, and um, then drowned. Their ship wrecked off the coast of um, Fire Island, and, uh, and they drowned, and their bodies were never found. Isn't that sad? It's a, kind of a sad... Um, I, I sort of feel like she was just like, coming into her own, you know? Um, and it, it, it didn't, uh, didn't work out for her. All right, so this was the model for women in journalism in the 1800s, which sets the stage for Nellie Bly, who is a name I'm sure you all have heard, right? I mean, when, you, when people talk about um, the history of journalism and the history of women in journalism, Nellie Bly's name always comes up. You know, she has her own stamp. She's, she's very well known. And the reason she's so well known is because she was extremely significant. Okay. So, two pieces of context. Increasing commercialization of the press, right? Publishers in it for, for money, trying to drive up circulation, get eyeballs. On the one hand, um, women caught in this sort of dilemma. On the other hand, traditional femininity, right? Um, versus, you know, um, a profession, a writing life, not being able to negotiate it very well. How are these things going to come together? They came together. Um, in the form of Nellie Bly. So Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Cochran. Uh, she was born in Pennsylvania. Her father died. Are you, are you sensing a pattern? Her father died when she was young, when she was just six years old. Uh, her nickname was Pink, by the way, um, which I think is, is neat. Um, her father had been married before. He had a, and had something like 10 children. Um, she was a result of the second marriage, um, five children in that family, and when he died, he hadn't left any provisions for the second family. So they were broke. So again, she, um, when she was a teenager, she went off to school to become a teacher because um, if a woman uh, was smart and wanted to work, that was often what she did. Um, but when she read a newspaper column in a local Pittsburgh newspaper that called women, working women a monstrosity, her future changed. She wrote an angry letter to the editor of the newspaper um, because she knew from her own experience and from that of many other women that it was necessary for women to work a lot of times, right? And so what were they to do? She also knew from her mother's experience, her mother, after the death of Nellie's um, dad, her mother had, had um, married um, an abusive man and that situation had not worked out. So Nellie Bly was really aware of some of the, um, the scary predicaments that women could get themselves into and, um, and had sympathy for it. So she wrote an angry letter to the editor of the newspaper in response to that column. And he was so impressed that he hired her to write for him and gave her the pen name, Nellie Bly. Um, she was feisty. She gave voice to people and issues that had not gotten a hearing before. She, um, the paper confined her to the women's page, which by this time newspapers had, um, had begun to publish um, as a way to draw in women readers. Because remember, new business model, advertising, eyeballs. Um, women are making a lot of the purchasing decisions for their families. Advertisers want to reach women. The newspapers start women's pages and are now more interested in... Um, in this type of content, right? So that's where they, they, they try to keep her writing about fashion. They try to assign her stories about flowers and the stuff that would have made Sarah Joseph Hale really happy, um, except she just kept busting out. She wrote stories about divorce laws, called for a reform of uh, divorce laws, um, largely because of her mother's experience. She wrote about um, the conditions for women who worked in factories she wrote about um, the medical treatment of the poor, right? She even convinced the uh, Pittsburgh paper to send her to Mexico. Um, and it was there that she really started to get this taste of adventure. She came back, and the newspaper tried to uh, put her back on the women's page. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I'm going to go to New York. And uh, she left a, um, a note for the columnist who had called 
working women a monstrosity that just said, Dear QO, that was his pen name. Dear QO, I'm off for New York. Look out for me. Bly. So she tried her luck. For six months, she tried to get someone to hire her, um, knocking on doors. Um, she couldn't even get a meeting because at this moment, women are not in newsrooms, right? So even the Margaret Fullers, even the few women who are able to write and get published are not doing it in a newsroom. And if they are, they're in the women's section, they're segregated. The newsroom was a dirty, um, you know, interesting place, but it was not thought to be an appropriate place for a lady, right? And that's where she wanted to be. She finally gets John Cockrell, the managing editor of the New York World, to take a meeting with her. Now, the New York World, you might remember, is owned by Joseph Pulitzer, right? Who, at this point, is um, competing with other newspapers um, in New York City. One of his chief rivals, of course, is William Randolph Hearst, who owned uh, the New York Journal, right? Because the type of news that had started with the penny press is carrying over into the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and eventually will culminate in this period we uh, sometimes call yellow journalism, which is this period of um, sensationalism in some newspapers, right? Um, Headlines get bigger and splashier. Newspapers use more illustrations, right? Um, And the idea, again, is to draw in more people, draw in more readers, keep them coming back so that we can then charge more for our advertising. So Nellie Bly gets a meeting with John Cockrell, and she tells him her ideas. You know, we need to write about these dirty conditions in our cities. We need to write about, um, you know, the poor and how they're treated. We need, you know, there's, there's, I want to cover these stories. And he says, okay, tell you what, you cover a story about Blackwell's Island, which was the insane asylum. That was um, a very scary place um, to be. And I'll give you a job. She takes the challenge. And she fakes insanity, which, to be fair, wasn't entirely difficult to do at the time, right? Um, Especially for a woman. Um, For a woman to get thrown into an insane asylum, all all it took was her husband saying, yeah, you know, she's crazy. And, you know, they'd lock her up for real. Um, So she fakes her way into this insane asylum. Um, And, and with the promise that the paper is going to send a lawyer to break her out, which eventually it does. She writes a 10-part dramatic series um, that is called 10 Days in a Madhouse. Um, The paper runs it with illustrations, and it tells about the awful conditions and mistreatment of the patients there. Abuse, unhealthy food, um, you know, poor, um, poor treatment, dirty conditions... Um, it was so. It was such a big deal um, when it uh, when it was published that it resulted in an official investigation of the asylum. Additional money was put in the budget to improve conditions there, and reforms were made. So, what's noteworthy about Nellie Bly's writing is that she makes herself a central character in the story. Right. She writes with, a, with, a, um, with drama, with this breathlessness, right? She writes in the first person. It's riveting, and it keeps people, it keeps people coming back. Um, we might consider this investigative reporting, in fact. You know, she was gaining access to a closed space and reporting on the conditions there and exposing... Um, you know, a a public problem, right? Um, Another way we might think of it is as stunt journalism. Now, stunt journalism is a term that 
is often used to denigrate what people like Nellie Bly did because she didn't just fake her way into an insane asylum. She also um, went around the world. She made it her mission to beat the, the um, fictitious character in Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days. She makes a deal with her newspaper, with the New York World, that I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, go around the world, they say. Sure, go to it. And then that becomes the story, right? She's traveling around the world. She's reporting back from, um, from where she is. She's, you know, readers are wondering, is she going to make it? Is she going to do it? Um, they, the, the New York world goes nuts with this. They, they create a board game. There are Nellie Bly dolls. She becomes a national celebrity. Um, Elizabeth, this part often gets left out. A woman named Elizabeth Bislin was writing for what was then called The Cosmopolitan Magazine. Now it's just Cosmopolitan Magazine, and it looked much different back then. Um, Bislin's editor, actually, when he got word that Nellie Bly was, was pulling this stunt, he said, I want you to do the same thing, and I want you to go beat her. So he gave her um, a few hours' notice, and so she left eight hours after Nellie Bly, and they raced around the world um, from ships and trains, and, um, and she didn't win, which is probably why she um, has, largely, has largely been forgotten. Um, so this is a diff- this is a this is a new um, a new type of journalism. Um, Bly continued to write tantalizing stories. She always sided with the underdog. She wrote sympathetic stories about the poor, about how women in marginalized groups were treated by police. Right? She traveled to Chicago, um, where she covered a strike, and she was the only reporter to write the story from the workers' perspective. She wrote profiles of interesting people. Um, you know, a boxer, um, a suffragist, um, an anarchist, right? She introduced a new genre um, for women. All right. This trend would trickle out um, and influence women at other newspapers. Um, William Randolph Hearst has had his own stunt reporters, right? Um, a woman uh, with the pen name of Annie Laurie worked for Hearst at the San Francisco Examiner, where she, um, similar to what Bly had done, had um, faked a fainting spell in the middle of a busy road just to test the ambulance response time, right? She also, um, when a devastating hurricane hit Galveston, Texas in 1900, uh, she dressed as a man to be allowed to go um, to cover the devastation there um, for her newspaper. And she eventually also made her way to New York City. Um, but I also have noticed this trend in other newspapers, in local newspapers. Here in Iowa, um, a woman by the name of Dorothy Ashby Pownall um, writing about Camp Dodge during World War I in 1918 uh, pulled stunts, so to speak, where she would put herself into the story. She would, um, you know, girl reporter takes mess with the soldiers. Girl reporter, tr- you know, gets gassed, puts on a gas mask just to write about it, just to, you know, it was a spectacle, right? Let's see what this girl can get herself into this time. It was treated as entertainment, right? It was a bit scandalous because these women are putting themselves in danger. They're putting themselves kind of, they're putting them out, they're themselves out in public, um, but it got attention and it got eyeballs, right? So they got the mass over the class. Now, a twin type of role that emerges at this time um, with the, that's often given the derogatory name of Sob Sister is uh, well embodied by a woman named Dorothy Dix. Um, she was the pioneer of advice columnists. At the time, she, was, uh, she became the most widely read and the richest woman journalist in the country. Her name was Elizabeth Merriweather Gilmer. Um, she began her career in New Orleans. She was married, um, but you guessed it, she was also widowed. Her husband had been mentally unstable, had a lot of problems, and eventually he died, meaning that she had to find work 
Um, in her case, um, she was acquainted uh, with a neighbor, a woman by the name of Eliza Nicholson, who owned the New Orleans Times Picune, who hired Gilmer, took pity on her, and hired her to write a story, which turned out to be so good that she brought her on as, as a columnist. So in 1894, um, Gilmer begins writing Dorothy uh, Sunday Salad, um, a column on the women's page, and that turns into Dorothy Dix Talks. That was the pen name. Dorothy Dix was the pen name she had given herself. She also was firmly on the side of women and the poor and the disenfranchised. She wrote more about domestic matters than Nellie Bly and the stunt reporters would do. Um, but she always displayed an appealing common sense and a sympathetic ear that made her instantly possible and, or popular. And she did write about important, important things. She wrote about temperance, which was the movement to prohibit alcohol. Um, that was a really important issue for a lot of women who felt victimized by their husbands um, um, or their fathers um, drinking and abuse, right? Um, she wrote emotionally. She wrote one of her most famous columns um, was called The Selfishness of Men. And it was about a ship that sank in 1898, killing 549 people. Of the 200 people who were saved from that shipwreck, only one was a woman. Um, and the story was that the people who, were sa- who had saved themselves were crew members and men from steerage, steerage who were alleged to have murdered women and children to save themselves. So it, it, was, a, it was a pretty big deal, and she wrote about it. Right. Um, she wrote tragically. She wrote from a feminine perspective. Right. That was what she was hired to do. Because publishers had learned that femininity could be marketable. Right. So you take the commercialization of the press, and you take these notions of femininity, and you combine them into a form of writing that sells, that gets, a, that gets attention, that, is, um, that serves the purposes of the publishers, right? Historian Alice Falls um, called this time a, a, the creation of a modern public space, a sphere, right, that was being created and in which women now had a voice for the first time. Women wrote about crimes of passion, these sob sisters, and it was here that they got their name. Um, this was a, a story from 1907. It was a famous, uh, the crime of the century. 20th century had a lot of trials of the century and crimes of the century. And in this case, what had happened was that a wealthy, philandering, unstable society man had murdered a prominent New York City architect on the roof of Madison Square Garden, because his wife, a beautiful social climber, had once been with the architect and then got married to um, the guy with the gun and had to explain why she wasn't a virgin. And the reason that she gave was that it had been against her will, causing the unstable gun-toting husband to hunt down... um, the architect and and kill him. So you can imagine what this story was like in New York City at this time, right? Um, and it ended in a, in, a, in a trial, right? This was scandalous stuff. It, you know, this was going to be a trial that hinged on um, testimony about um, sex and bondage, and there was a velvet swing involved, and it was it was really it was really scandalous. Now, at the time, women didn't sit on juries in New York City, right? Um, and many observers thought that this courtroom, especially on this trial, was no place for a woman if we were going to be discussing matters that were that inappropriate, right? But four formidable reporters demanded that they be allowed to cover the trial for their readers. And the judge allowed them there to sit at a table four in a row, watching, observing, and writing about the characters involved. The male reporters were none too pleased. Did they feel threatened? Perhaps. 
but the newspaper publishers put these women there to provide the woman's perspective, to provide, um, to, to, to write um, emotionally, right? Um, Dorothy Dix, Ada Patterson, Annie Laurie, and Nixola Greeley-Smith, who is the granddaughter of Horace Greeley, by the way, um, one of the, the male colleagues wrote a column saying this is a travesty, these women should not be here, they should not be allowed, and he called them sob sisters, and the label stuck, right? But what I want to say about this is that this influenced generations of women to come. So while these women may not have been respected, while they may have been um, treated as girl reporters, as spectacles, right, as sob sisters, they found a way to make their voices heard, right? They found a way to raise issues that weren't being discussed. They found a way to advocate for themselves and for other women and marginalized people. And moving forward, a lot of women wore this label proudly. Um, the woman I had mentioned before from Iowa called herself a sob sister, but she wore it proudly because it enabled her to do a type of work that she enjoyed, that she found, um, that she found professionally uh, fulfilling, right? So pioneers like Nellie Bly and Dorothy Dix inspired women to flock to newspapers at the end of the 1890s and into the 20th century. When Nellie Bly started her career, only about 5% of journalists were women. Um, that would rise to about 25% in 1930. So we see a real influx of women into the newsroom about this time. Um, and I think it's important to note that these women were doing what women had not done before. And they, they were not following the model of Sarah Josepha Hale. They were not even following the model of Margaret Fuller. Um, but their gender was working for them, right? Um, they had to fight to get there, but they found a way, and they found a way to create a public space for themselves and to make women's voices heard. Now, I'm curious to know what your questions are. So that's a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. So what questions does this raise for you? Are there any barriers in journalism today that women are still having to overcome? Are there any barriers in journalism today that women are still having to overcome? That's a really excellent question. And what I would tell you is this. I just threw out the number, um, 25%, that in about 1930, women, um, um, newsrooms were about 25% female, right? Um, that proportion today is not all that much higher. It's about a third. Um, so when you look at the period from 1930 to you know, 2016, you might expect it to be, um, to be a little higher, but it's not. Um, it, it, it's, it's remained stuck at about, um, you know, I would say 36% for, um, for quite a long time. So I think, I, think it's a really, I think it's a really good question. What I will say is that the history of women in journalism shows that these individual women often created jobs for themselves by creating something new, a new genre. So Nellie Bly created stunt reporting. It was a new thing. It hadn't existed before. It was successful. It got repeated. It got imitated, right? Um, a woman um, that I've written about at the beginning, um, or in the 19, starting in the 1930s, named Sylvia Porter, created personal finance journalism. It was a new thing. Hadn't existed. She wasn't allowed to do what other financial journalists were doing, so she did something new. She worked her way around it. What happens when that, when women create these new genres is that oftentimes then that particular genre gets attached to their gender. So personal finance becomes something that women do, or stunt reporting becomes something that women do. You see what I'm saying? So I think sometimes while these, um, 
individuals create these, these opportunities and open doors where the doors had been closed before. Sometimes that also creates um, what we might call um, you know, um, ghettos, where they're sort of stereotyped, and then the expectation becomes that they'll stay in those specific roles rather than um, really being able to branch out. That was a really good question. Thank you. Yeah. Were those beginning women reporters paid a lot less than the men reporters than the newspapers? Were the, be- the early women reporters paid a lot less than the male reporters? Of course. Absolutely. Now, Dorothy Dix, I mean, some of the enterprising women um, could, um, who, the ones who were really smart about it, she trademarked her name, she became syndicated, she, um, she became pretty wealthy, but that was few and far between for the most part. Um, yeah, and, and they were not hired as full-time salaried journalists, right? Usually they had to prove themselves by doing freelance work, getting paid space rates, meaning they got paid like per column inch or um, you know, f- for the content that they, that they provided. That was a lot different than, than getting a salary. So, you know, so yeah, absolutely. And the expectation too was that men were the breadwinners. So even if a woman didn't have a male provider, it was still, um, it was still assumed that she wasn't a breadwinner like a man would be in a similar situation. Was it just spreading that men had names, or did all uh, reporters have pen names and <laughs> did, Okay, so did, was it just women who had pen names, or did all reporters have pen names to protect themselves? Um, pen names were, they were used by both men and women, more often by women. Um, you know, but you saw, I mean, Mark Twain, obviously, Samuel Clemens went by Mark Twain. You had columnists, uh, men who wrote column, newspaper columns often gave themselves a pen name to give a persona to the column. Um, women used pen names more often, though, um, to protect themselves because it wasn't necessarily... Um, res- respected that they were being so sort of public with themselves, right? Um, and also because, depending on what they were writing about, and you see this as we move into the 20th century, women start using initials um, to hide their gender. So while Nellie Bly and Dorothy Dix chose very feminine um, pen names because their reporting was um, very gendered, right? Um, if a woman wanted to wanted to write about something that was um, not gendered, that so to speak, that was you know in finance or politics, she would often use uh, initials, um, so that you know you couldn't you couldn't see that she was a woman. There's a question here. Um, I guess when you said that the the, the, the percentages kind of stayed the same in the quarters, um, I guess why is that? Do you see that kind of like changing in the near? Okay, so when you look at the, the ratios of um, women to men in the newsroom, why is that? And do, um, do I see that changing? Um, another, that's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and, and the reason it's so interesting is that um, classrooms in journalism and mass communication um, are about two-thirds women, right? In our programs, it's about two-thirds women. And then you, when you look at newsrooms, that the ratio is flipped. So full-time journalists working in news organizations, um, you know, women hover around, you know, 36%. Um, and the higher you go sort of in the ranks, the lower that percentage gets. So that women um, today are about, I say, I think 18% of, of publishers, right? Why is that? Which is a really good question. Um, my scholarship and others' scholarship has shown that it's an issue of culture, and this relates to my earlier response about individual people finding ways to be successful when there are um, constraints, right? Finding ways to work around discrimination, finding ways to, um, you know, to... to um, use what they have, use their resources to make their way. But that's different than 
the culture of a place changing, right? So like for these early women, right, letting one woman, two women, three women into a newsroom, you know, is a lot different than the newsroom changing, (laughs) right, to incorporate these women's voices, experiences, and perspectives, right? So I think what, what you find when you look at the history is that a lot of times, even as numbers go up, um, and this, isn't, this doesn't just apply to women, but it applies to um, racial and ethnic minorities um, and, and other um, you know, places where we see issues of diversity. Um, just you know, hiring people who are different um, and bringing them into a system that remains the same, right, doesn't do much to encourage real inclusion or diversity of perspectives over the long term. So my, my position is that it's, a, it's an issue of culture. You know? It's one thing to come into a newsroom, it's another to change the culture. Yeah. In terms of sports journalism, yes. do you think the history of women has not been part of that? Or just, what's, it? what's the history of women in sports journalism? Um, another really great question, because into um, the 20th century, you know, women had to fight really hard to be um, allowed to cover, especially men's sports, right? It, sports, some of these areas, sports and politics, um, hard news, were, are considered very masculine beats. Um, and so women really didn't get to cover sports in, um, in any kind of notable numbers until the 1970s after, you know, um, um, affirmative action policies. Um, And and even then, there were, um, you know, lots of issues surrounding um, access to athletes, um, locker room interviews, um, you know, harassment on the job. So I would say that it's, um, you know... Sports is is one of those areas that was sort of the last to kind of become more accepting um, of women, and it's still work in progress. Yeah. All right. So through your research, do you have a favorite or more influential female in journalism of this time? Okay. So um, based on my own research, do do I have sort of a favorite? Um, do I have a favorite journalist? I, you know, I have to say that um, the person that I, 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 um, that I wrote about, I wrote a biography of Sylvia Porter, and she's still probably my favorite uh, female journalist to talk about. Um, she started working during the Depression. Her father had died, um, but she was, you know, she was brilliant. She started working the, during the Depression. Um, she wanted to cover finance, and she um, created... Um, a real empire. I mean, she became a, a brand. She was read by 40 million people. Um, and what's interesting to me about her is that people don't know who she is now. But at the time, she was as well known as Oprah, you know, uh, Martha Stewart. She made the tops of the list of the most influential women. Um, but, you know, but, but history is full of, of um, interesting people. And certainly, you know, some of these women are, are fascinating as well. Since you mentioned that um, most of these female journalists um, like wrote about women's suffrage, did they meet with any of like the suffragettes, or if, or did they like actually go to meetings or kind of talk with like? Susan? That's a really good question. So, did these women um, meet with the suffragists, write about the suffragists, um, and were they involved in um, in the suffrage movement? Right. Um, Nellie Bly did. She interviewed uh, and wrote a profile of Susan B. Anthony, right, a famous suffragist. Um, and they, they did write profiles of women who were part of the movement. Um, and even if they were supportive of the movement, however, I want to say that these women are different from, um, say, Amelia Bloomer, who is an editor of a women's suffrage newspaper. So they, these women, the women working at newspapers, are not part of the movement. They cover the movement, um, but there's a separate type of, of female journalist who is, um, whose journalism um, serves the movement and who, who is part of it, right? So you have separate sort of suffrage newspapers and publications that are, um, you know, politically involved and engaged, 
Um, and so these women who, you know, they were supportive, um, but you knew not necessarily of, of the movement. Yeah, good question. Yeah, okay. Do you think that there's going to be a type of stunt journalism today that could make someone as famous as Nellie Bly? Do I think there's going to be a type of stunt journalism today that could make someone as famous as Nellie Bly? That's a really interesting question. I wonder if it exists, right? Um, with social media, it would seem that, um, that, it, that something similar could um, absolutely, I can, I, can, I can envision it. Um, and you know, this type of reporting now might be called immersion reporting. Things have, they, they have different labels over time, right? Um, and um, so, absolutely. I, and I, I also think there are a lot of parallels between um, the upheaval that we're seeing now in the business models of journalism and um, the ways that newspapers develop new business models in the 19th century, right? Um, the model of charging for advertising and aiming for high circulation, you know, that may not be panning out. Uh, for news organizations on the internet, so they're going to be developing a different model, and who knows what we'll see after that. So, yeah. Um, were women in households and in the public absorbing media on like a daily basis, or was there any you know backlash from husbands or families to like not read about Nellie Bly or other types of? Oh, good question. Were were women at home um, engaging with this content on a daily basis? Were they reading it, and was there any backlash? You know, um, absolutely. I'm sure that there was there was backlash. You know, and and I'm and just you know, women are not a homogenous group. So you know, just like Sarah Hale was not um, at all you know supportive of Margaret Fuller or appreciative of her. You know, there were plenty of women who would have thought that Nellie Bly was um, you know a horror, scandalous, right? Um, so. Um, but as to the question of were people sort of, um, you know, eating the content up, yeah, they were, you know. And, and that really gets to this larger point of what commercialization made possible, which was even if this was inappropriate behavior for a lady, it made money, right? And so this kind of populist form of journalism became a way that women could make their way, um, could make their way into the industry, because if they could bring the numbers with them, um, if they could make a profit for the owners of these newspapers, then who was, who was to stop them, right? So I think I'll end there. Thank you all very much. I'm glad you were here. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Book Notes Plus podcast, This week's program looks at the British author Charles Dickens with Jenny Harley, Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Roehampton in London. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.